Hey. Thanks for stopping by. Um, let me see here. I'm. This is, uh, I haven't gone live. I used to do this on Facebook a little bit, but I haven't done it on uh, YouTube very much at all. So it's the first time I've gone live on YouTube. So I'm just kind of going, all right. So I can see there's two people watching, I think. Um, can you guys hear me? Just let me know up or down if you can hear me or not. And do you hear the music as well? The music is just for me, but if you guys hear it, it doesn't really bother me. So, can you guys hear me all right? Oh, I got a hello. Sweet. Can you hear me all right? I wish it was a good way I could check it. There's no like audio levels on this YouTube thing, which is pretty annoying. So, whatever. All right. Well, let me uh, just tell you what I plan to do. So, I just want to first off hang out for a little bit, um, test my audio setup, make sure it works okay. Um, this is my first live stream, so um, that's, yeah, I just, I've, I've got a 600 subscribers on here, you know, I, I've hit that a couple of days ago. Every time I upload a, a video, it, like, depending on what it is, I get, like, more subscribers or less subscribers, because some of it's, like, on Bible study stuff, some of it's on Emacs stuff, and, like, there's, like, some mishmash there where people think, oh, this is, uh, oh, okay, no problem, you can't hear the music, because it doesn't really matter. I'm using OBS like everybody else does for the most part, and I cannot get it to make two inputs into this, which is a problem, but whatever. Um, I'll keep it out anyway. So um, what I wanted to do with this is just kind of go over my, uh, my dot files. I think it's pretty helpful for people as far as when they're starting out and figuring, okay, how do you set up uh, Doom Emacs? How do you what does that even look like? And so if you have any questions like that, like go ahead and, and check it out. That's cool. Uh, or ask questions as, as we move along here. I've got my chat here because I've got two computer screens. So it's a, it's a lot to look at all at once here. But um, And then after that, we'll look at just uh, uh, the future of this channel, which sounds like, uh, yeah, there's probably a 30 second delay. That's just typically how it is because of like a, a YouTube streamers like playing a video game. Um, you don't want that delay to be right. You don't want it to be right on top of each other because then someone can, I, I forget what it's even called in gaming, but like stream snipe you basically, they can watch your moves, but like 30 seconds is long enough to where that doesn't really matter. So unless if it's like, I don't know, some card game online, then it's probably, probably a good help, but I'm sure there's ways around that. So, uh, in this, yeah, what, what it will do is just look at how I've set up studying the Gospel of Mark, and I'm using Org Rome to kind of show all that. And then we'll uh, just, I think what I'll do is I'll just kind of show you working through the next section I have in the Gospel of Mark there. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. So, uh, oh yeah, using Doom. All right, sweet. So let's get into Doom right now. Um, I have the buttons here. All right, so here we are. Here's my Doom. And uh, typically, whenever I start it up, because what I've already did this, but I hit space H R R, and that kind of reloads everything really quickly for me, and that allows me to when I open up um, like certain uh, files, um, it doesn't get up. This this pops up automatically, which I like it there when I want it to be there, but not all the time. So. Uh, recommendation where to start. I, you know, it, it really depends. Like if you're into Doom Emacs or just Emacs in general, or if you're like into the Bible study stuff, this, this is probably the best place to start when it comes to anything. Cause I'm right here. I'm live. You can ask me any question you might want to ask me. So, um, this question though, as far as where to start, um, well, it depends on what you want to get into as far as what my channel, uh, is interested to you. Cause like Bible study stuff, you can, I may, I know my brother wants me to make a playlist for 
other people to look at when he's talking to people about the Bible. But Emac stuff, um, this will be a good start, and a few others. But for Emac stuff, there's other people that do a much better job explaining Doom Emacs and all that kind of stuff when it comes to all this. So somebody else will figure that one out. <laughs> all right, um, let's jump into the uh my dot files so i've just learned out how to do your dot files now for those of you who are just super new to all this a dot file is basically your settings but it's all plain text and i like that concept you know i've kind of traveled from windows using windows a bunch and then uh i forget i think i learned how to use um emacs and I was trying to use Emacs with Windows, and like there were some really problems with it, like getting the dictionary to work, getting the spell check to work. It was just a really, it was not fun at all. So I was kind of learning how to do that. And then I got to uh, Linux, and now inside Linux, I'm learning, I'm watching all these other you know, YouTubers, like uh, DistroTube is probably the one I watch probably the most, but also just some other people who um, show me how to use it and plain text files for settings is like to me that's the way to go because it's so easy to change settings on the on the fly um yeah the learning curve to this is uh super steep so it's really hard to recommend emacs to people unless people are just like gung-ho about it i always recommend people to use obsidian so that would be the website obsidian.md i keep thinking about making videos on that but i just haven't yet so Maybe someday I will. All right, let's get into the dot files. Now, you see my, here's my files. So I, space FP gets you to this section. And you notice I have your, typically you have three files in here. The custom file, um, in Doomy Max, they don't want you to mess with that because um, for some reason when things get updated, it might delete all that, which happened to me once before, but you know, whatever. Um, I went back and changed it. So for now it stays there and it hasn't given me much problems. But uh, they want you to mostly mess in this uh, con, uh, config.el file, your config file, your um, init file, and your packages file. So we'll start with the init file to make more sense of my .org file. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's go to the top. You hit double G to go to the top of any document here. And it just kind of tells you exactly what you're doing. So these are commented out here. Um, yeah, I am also attracted to the easy Bible notes of the thing. So I would honestly, maybe I'll do this in one of my other videos, is how to set up what I'm doing inside of uh, obsidian.md. So that's the website is obsidian.md. It just makes a bunch of uh, markdown notes instead of .org notes. So markdown is a, uh, just, it's got a, to me, it's got a bigger user base on the online community of things, not the like coder community of things, whatever. That's what uh, org mode is pretty. I think Markdown is based off of org mode to some to some degree. Um, so anyways, here's the things that I've got set up for mine. I'm not going to show you too many of them. I've been messing around with Deft. I used to use that with uh, before I was using the package called org roam. There's this one called Deft and Deft helps you with your notes. Maybe we'll look at that if somebody wants to remind me a little bit later. Um, but basically, the main thing I wanted to look at, you can go through all these. What I like about this is, let, let's say I wanted to set up, I don't know here, um, workspaces. To set it up, all I have to do is delete this line, this uh, semicolon. To do that, you can just hit X on your keyboard, and there it is. Now you can now I can load up workspaces, hit space RR to reload my entire settings. It's doing that, and then it's going to start to build up that particular file. And now I have workspaces loaded, and I forget what that does. Um, but I was looking into it. I think it has to like do it like whenever you load up space max again, it just reloads everything for you to where you have all your files at. So whatever. Um, the last thing I wanted to look at is just what I've got down here at the bottom called literate. Now what literate does is that each of these are called, I forget, they're like flags or modules. I think they're called modules. And when you uncomment these lines, it's, you're basically telling Emacs, Hey, build this particular program and it's going to go find all the different programs to make something and what this allows me to do is that instead of having instead of editing my code inside of uh inside of here which is fine i can i can edit it normally i would make comments inside here to explain what i'm doing but now that i've got it i uncomment that i make this file called config.eor uh config.org 
And then um, I make an org file. And this org file allows me to actually create this code of to make my config file the way it works. So it's easier to manage it for me. So that all you have to do is uncomment that. And then you start here and hit, you know, begin uh, source code and make sure it's in ELISP. And then you can have the exact same thing. Oops. What uh, this was, it's, 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 it's this, but easier to manage, I would say. So like, you know, who cares about this stuff? But with like all this, it has all my nice stuff. So this doesn't look like other org or, or other people's um, org modes that I've seen or their Emacs that I've seen. And that's because I've spent some time taking some stuff away because I don't use this for coding. I use this simply for writing and taking notes. So it's got some of my setup here and I may make this available on, um, on GitHub probably to, to where you can go and check some of the stuff out. This is cool. Cause it like showed me actually, you know what, let me set this up real quick. Um, yeah, I gotta do two of them here. Um, there we go. Now what it allows me to do and it may get a little cramped. I may take it off at some point, but basically now it tells you what keys I'm using when I'm moving around. Also, though, my movement keys, that doesn't show because that just gets a little redundant. All right. Um, and this allows me to read EPUB files. So if you're somebody who likes EPUB files, you can watch. Um, you can read an EPUB file. Like, for instance, what I'll do is when I'm studying, let's see, I'm opening up a new window there. I'm already going to delete that because that's a little annoying. But let's let's see here. Um, uh, it's Bibles. Yeah, I've got a few Bibles here. So I've got the NASB 77 version. And this is... Uh, so I've got the Bible right here. So I can read different versions of the Bible that I have there that I want to read. And it's just like... A, it's not what Kindle uses. They use their own Mobi or AZW3 files. And this is a EPUB file, which is uh, open. I think it's an open source type of file. So there's no DRM with it, which is really nice. All right. And then with that, I can, uh, you know, just read parts of the Bible there. So I do that. Um, this is not part of my org roam, like file searching thing. But I, if I'm preaching, because I, I do that like once a month right now, um, it allows me to use a version that other people are using. So that's nice. So like the CSB, actually, I've never actually opened this up yet because I just bought it. It was like two or three bucks, whatever. So I bought that. And now I've got like uh, Ruth there and go to Ruth chapter. Well, go to Ruth chapter one. That would work. Um, is that going to do it for me? Okay. Well, I haven't messed with this very much. So. Huh. Doesn't look very good. It doesn't look good, but that's just what happens. All right. So that allows me to read EPUBs, which is a really nice feature to have. This, I believe, like when I go up and down, like control F or back, doesn't do it right now, but normally it'll just like my little cursor, I'm pointing at the screen, my little cursor will like blink and be like, oh, that's where you're at, which is pretty nice. All right, let's get out of this and move on to um, how I set up studying the Bible. So let's go to uh, Mark chapter one here. There it is. So here's what I've got. And uh, I love this setup as sort of studying the gospel of Mark. So I have my text here. And so each line here is a verse. And then what I do is, is that in Emacs or Doom, at least you can uh, open up new windows. So I open up a new window and I open up what's called my hub file. Uh, yeah, you know, I've actually, I used org presenter when I was teaching class online, like at the beginning of COVID, um, Orc Presenter, it doesn't have the visual pizzazz that you would want with a um, with a presentation. I think most people's presentations are just like, you've got your text and you've got bullet point stuff. I typically try not to use PowerPoint if that's all I'm gonna do, because I think it looks very, um, it's, so, it's so commonplace in like business rooms and 
just how everybody uses PowerPoint that I try not to do that. I try to make mine like really visual and it's really hard to make Emacs look really visual like that. So maybe if I was doing like a presentation to a bunch of like geeks and stuff, I'd probably be like, all right, yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll respect this, but most people would be like, who cares? Um, where are the pictures at? So here is my Mark Hub, and this is where all my notes kind of gather together where um, I jump off into different notes. So this is where I come back to every time. So next month, I'm beginning to teach a class. I'm going to do a class on the miracles in the Gospel of Mark. And so we're just going to take several stories or maybe one story each class period and discuss it as it relates to Jesus and his power. So I listed out here all the different miracles that he does in the Gospel of Mark. And now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just going through the Gospel of Mark and studying them and connecting them to the different ideas that are happening. So now I have my theme here. Um, is I've got different themes I want in the Gospel of Mark. So I've studied the Gospel of Mark a number of times, and each time you study it, you pick up on a different theme. Like one of the ones last time I studied was this theme of people bowing down to Jesus it happens a lot. And I haven't gone too far with this yet, but... Um, in Mark's gospel, we have in Luke chapter three and verse 11, let's go down there. Um, the spirits, the unclean spirits fall down to Jesus and they cry out, you are the son of God. And so I'm like, oh, like that's, you know, that's really important because it doesn't happen here, but it happens in a lot of different miracles Jesus performs. So here's Legion, the, the, the demons called Legion doing the same thing here, um, where, they come to Jesus and they bow down to him. Now that Greek word there is the same word, I believe it's proskuneo, but don't don't quote me on that. Um, it's it's this idea of the, them falling down. It's one of the words for worship. And this happens not just here, but the woman with the issue of blood, the same thing happens to her. Um, I'm trying to think of all the other places this happened off the top of my head, but I'm online and I'm like, you know, you can't ever you can't ever do math in a setting like this. So you can't even find certain quotes you're thinking of in a setting like this. So um but anyways, I'm recording those as I'm studying the book, and that to me is very helpful. So the way this note works for right now is I have my title of my note. I have the hashtag, which they just, this, there's, there's ways to do tag inside of org Rome. The way you do that, I think, is like, you do this, you go Rome underscore tags. Then you like write a bunch of stuff, or you just write, like every section is like a new tab and you can, I don't know if I'm going to find any just now, but maybe I'll find one. Yeah. So this one here, I taught a class on, on Job and I've got something about Elihu here. I think on the, actually the class itself. So that inside those brackets of the tag, I don't like that because it looks a little sloppy to me. Um, so I don't use that anymore. I just use this. And the way I use it as the tag is I open up the note hit space NRR and I open up and there's all the backlinks here. So the, I only have one backlink, which was the exact same note I was just looking at. And um, <laughs> I feel like every time I try to explain org Rome, I feel like I'm just going to lose people because it's just like, it's a little complicated to explain. So I'm going to try to, I guess watch my other video on org Rome, not the, the one with like, yeah, Watch the, my most recent one on org Rome to kind of understand what's happening here. But basically, um, to risk it being misunderstood, org Rome, all it is is a series of files that are linked to one another. And this pane here shows you where this file is linked to other files. So, like, see here... These are file, these are links to other files. But what this thing shows you is if I were to open up this Mark Hub note, this note here would be, uh, would find its link in it. So it's a backlink, not a forward link, but a backlink. Every time I try to say that out loud, it's like I can't really get through it. Um, so that, that's, that's what this is. And, um, all right, let's go back to Mark Hub. So the hub file is just an org file. Uh, let's say the question here. So hub file. Yes, um, but not. It's it's not just the verses though. With the verse, it goes to other notes inside the file. So here's all my theme to the Gospel of Mark, and I can go to different notes. So I haven't actually looked anything yet there because. 
but halfway through, you really get into the suffering theme of Jesus in Mark's gospel. But, um, uh, like warning not to speak. This is not a. This is not a. This is not a book here. It, this is my notes on the particular topic that's being talked about. But if I wanted to open this up, then I would get to where this is located, and I forget where that was. Uh, Twenty verse twenty-five. So, go down to verse twenty-five there. Yeah, be quiet and come out of him. So Jesus was telling people to be quiet a bunch, or the, especially particularly with the demons. Don't say anybody, anything. Other people he did as well. So. That's a note I wanted to make sure that I've caught, and I'm I'm tracking as I'm studying through it. So I haven't gotten super far in the Gospel of Mark here, um, but I just wanted to let you know that's that's kind of what I'm thinking when I'm creating a note. And maybe this will make more sense as I'm creating notes versus kind of explaining how I'm doing it, because in my mind, a lot of this stuff makes sense. But sometimes if I try to explain it to people, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about, or this is too far it's too far ahead for me. So those are the themes I'm looking at. And as I'm studying the Gospel of Mark, I'm constantly going through, like saying, oh, here's this idea. Oh, here's this idea. That's, you know, really helpful helpful to know. And uh, something to keep track of. So it's not only I'm looking at themes in the Gospel of Mark. If I find something else, I want to make sure I'm tracking that as well. So like, for instance, if you've done any sort of studying of the Gospel of Mark, you know that Mark uses this word immediately, or the Greek word there being euthus, like 52, 57 times. So I'm just making a quick note as far as how often it's being used. And all this is actually, this is just a tap, oops, oh, I did the wrong one there. Yeah, that happens. So like sometimes you create notes and um, let's see, let's fix this. Um, yeah, that's right. Sorry. All right. So I need to delete this really quick. So I created two notes that were the same name immediately. And sometimes and I have to go back and actually delete that note for this to work. But basically, I want to know that when this immediately is being used so I can like keep tabs through it throughout the rest of the gospel. So what I do to create a note is I create an asterisk next to the word I want to make a note with. I highlight it. And to highlight it, I hit B. And that highlights whatever I'm looking at, visual mode. And then I hit space, N, I, R to insert a note. And typically, if it's a note that you've highlighted or something you've highlighted, it'll give you a list of things you've looked at. And I don't want any of these. So I hit backspace and hit start to spell immediately. This is the one I want. And now this note takes me to what I was just looking at there. Um, this is just... Uh, a little note that I have here, but what's important here is not just what's the content, because who cares about this, but what other notes are connected to it here. So let's let's see. Yeah, so the bad thing is, is that it, it reads my verse numbers as, um, what do you call it? Uh, line number. So it doesn't show me the line here of Mark chapter one, but see, even the gospel of, in the first chapter here, you've got it like mentioned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times. Three of them are when Simon, when Peter heals, um, when Jesus heals uh, Peter's mother-in-law or Simon's mother-in-law there. So I want to just record that there. So I normally have that when I find it here. And oh, look at that. Um, I didn't have that one there. So now I can insert a link here. I highlight it with V, oops, V space N R I. open it up and then type out immediately. Now it's highlighted. All right, now I've got that link there too. And that's super nice. All right, now let's go through here to show you a little bit of how I'm taking notes here. So when it comes to writing notes, I've got all these separate notes here. And the whole idea behind taking notes like this is you are just making notes for the sake of making notes at this point. And... Um, I think for a lot of people at this stage, typically they're just a little afraid to make notes because what if it's wrong? What if it's bad? What if later on I figure out or how do I begin to make notes? And like the biggest advice I have here is just, just, just record what you got. You know, you don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry about, um, messing up because, um, 
because eventually, you know, um, you're going to come back and see like, oh, I did make a mistake. And then you're going to like comment on why this was a mistake. And then you're developing your thought in your own thinking. So I really uh, like that there. All right. Um, it's you, you can think of this as like a journal, but I think uh, Nicholas Lumen, who created the Zettelkasten system, created it as what he's known as a septic tank. So all your notes are just in this big pile here, and eventually it's going to bubble up to something good that you're going to have. And this has already been super worthwhile to me in the first place. Um, we've got a question here where your help files live. Oh, yeah, sure. You can show where they're at. I'll show you where they're at. So here's my Bible. Here's all of my notes here. So I've got all the different books of the Bible. And then what was that? Oh, okay. That was like a probably a video idea there. Um, that's is going to take a little while. So this is where all my, my books of the Bible are. And I'm just going to type out this here. So uh, my hub note is actually... So notice here we've got Mark double zero. That double zero is my hub note itself. So that's what this note is. So you can see right here, I've got my home folder and inside my home folder, I have my sync folder that syncs between my phone and my computer and whatever else I want to sync it to. And then I have this zip slip box, which stands for the Zettelkasten, Zettel German uh, slip box or Zettelkasten is German for slip box. And then I have the double zero, which is my hub note for this particular book of the Bible. So that typically all my files here uh, live inside my hub note. So let's go back to. They all live. Uh, they all live inside that single slip box because you don't want to create hierarchies of your different notes, because what happens when you do that is, well, as long as. Um, as long as um, you can search recursively, so you can not only search the files, but the, the folders inside of the folder you're looking at, but inside those files, you're going to be just fine with this. But I typically try to have all my files in the same section because I don't want to be searching like I was here just a second ago, you know, going this way to search for things. I typically just want to use either, you know, search, or I want to use the different hub notes that I have, or the different tags that I have. I don't want to actually look at looking at all my list of files and going, oh, okay, here's here's what they have. So that's what I do when I'm looking at this here. Um, I just came to the Catholic channel. I mean, just came to the channel. What do you think of the Catholic faith? Um, this is not for those kind of discussion. No. Um, this is not, here's what I'll say about this. Um, I think the Catholic faith and in, current, in its current form, and typically after the probably second second century, has like serious problems with its centralization of power. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence that, well, there's there's not a lot of that evidence that Peter ever claimed to be the uh, first pope or that he was called the first pope. I know there's Matthew chapter fifteen or eighteen where he says, "Upon this rock I build my church." But um, my biggest thing when it comes to the Bible study is, is that if people are teaching something that you really can't find in your Bible, like you're going to have a lot of problems. And I've talked to a lot of Catholics who do show me where things are in their Bible, um, but it's a, it's a pretty big interpretational problem. But um, that's, I, I don't, I'm not Catholic. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. And I'm always going to be just a Christian, nothing, nothing else. I'm not going to have like a, a denominational tie. Like I'm not part of a denomination. I think that that stuff's uh, that's post-Christian ideas. Anyways, um, I've thought about uh, considering the future of the channel, like tackling some of these problems that are with with church government and how churches are formed, and just the problem of centralization of power and like how that breeds a lot of particular problems. What we need is like a, a decentral. De we we need decentralized churches. Um, that are guard uh, that are um, I'm getting way off topic here, but uh, that are governed by uh, shepherds. Uh, plurality of elders is is really what the what the New Testament model is. So, um, if you have any other questions about the Catholic faith, you know, or books you want me to read or whatever, that's cool too. I'm not above that. I'm always. But here's the thing: like, there's a lot of good thinkers there that I really appreciate, like Thomas Aquinas. Like, I love Thomas Aquinas. Um, and uh, some others as well. 
So, anyways, that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> All right. Getting back on track here. Um, but appreciate your question there. Uh, so, when it comes to the... Um, what I'm studying here, I'm trying to think about where I was at. Um, is, yeah, let's, let's go through chapter one. And I'll just show you how uh, chapter one looks like as far as it's set up. So what I've done inside of Emacs, and let me show you that just a second here. Oops, yeah. Um, I'll show you this in this mode here. I've done a video on this already. It's called, uh, I forget, text highlighting in org mode. And that is, I've done this. You can go check the video out to see what it does. So what this does here is allows me that, let's see, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to make a note about this, or just not make a note about the spirit, just, just highlight this word spirit. To highlight, again, you know, you hit V, and then you can just move the cursor over here. Or, if you're really cool, I use Vim mode, and it's what Doom Max does, is, is that you can go forward and just hit the word letter E, and that goes to the next, the end of the word that you're on. So E goes to the end of the word that you're on. Then you go to the next word by hitting E again. B goes back a word. W just goes to the first letter of the word that you're on, but I typically like to go to the end of the word. So let's go back to spirit, hit E there. And then I want to surround this with two asterisks. <laughs> it's a hard word to say, but two asterisks. And that will um, make it bold in Emacs. But because of this says here, not only is it going to be bold, but slant, it's also going to be italic. So let's do capital S. That surrounds, I'm saying, okay, this region of text, I want to surround it with something. And I want to surround it with uh, uh, asterisks. And uh, I have a uh, keyboard. Oops. I have a keyboard with uh, no. Uh, oh, my word. Um, I got to concentrate. Uh, I have a keyboard with no keycap letters on it. So I. It's, it's great for touch typing and all, but as soon as I get into the numbers, I, I, I lose track of where I'm supposed to be. So I got to double check it a few times. So notice there, it's got the spirit there is, is not only bold now, but it's also highlighted a little bit. Now, move forward a bit. And let's say I wanted to, to um, surround this with a slash, a slant, forward slash, which would be uh, italic, but because italic, let's see, this slash here, italic, foreground, dark salmon, it's going to change to salmon, and that's going to look like that. So, oh, sweet. So, like, people who are really into the inductive Bible study mode, which are uh, inductive Bible study method, something I'm really interested in, and that's what I use to study most of the time, is just, you know, asking that inductively and such. Um, that's really fun to start messing with things, because you can, like, really make your text look um, cool. And you can like visually figure things out as you're looking at your text. Let's see. Let's see. Let's do another one here. Nope. That's not one. There. So there's a couple of them you can um, highlight as you're studying. So that's what I'll do sometimes here. But typically, I, I just try to make notes and make it all text-based. So what I do here is that the... Bibles that are on GitHub that I have, I put up on GitHub to study with, you can't, I have it here. And my headings for each of them is just basically what's like a table. So this is a, technically it's, it's actually a table. Emacs org mode is pretty awesome for tables. So you can like, I'm going to mess this up here, but basically you can create your own table here and hit tab. And that doesn't look good because tabs, uh, this never looks really great. Um, if you don't have enough space for it. So let's get out of, I use uh, Olivetti mode. So normally, without Olivetti mode, your text just looks like this. And that's okay, but I like it. I like a little spacing because it makes it look a little nicer. So I typically do that. But because I'm working with um, tables, let's go back to this. And this is just a table. So you can actually give it several things. And you can... Um, basically, it just looks like a table. But my purpose is, is just the fact that um, it changes the color, and it actually changes the font back to a regular uh, monospace font, which is cool. So that's what I do. So I've got John's Ministry right there. But as I'm looking, you've, I've already looked at these notes here and here. But uh, another thing that I'm going to do as I'm studying is I'm going to go, okay, um, here's a new place, and I, I'm trying to get better at picking out my geography not picking it out, but just noticing geography. It just does certain things. Like one of the things that helped me understand 
the difference between when Jesus heal or not heals, but when Jesus feeds the five thousand and feeds the four thousand in the Gospel of Mark and the other Gospels is like, it's like so what? Like, all right, here's Mark. He's writing. He's in a lot of space because he's writing on papyrus or whatever he chooses to wrote the first Gospel on. But he's got a, a limited amount of space, and why does he record basically the same miracle twice? And it wasn't until I started paying attention closer to the um, geography of the Bible that I was like, oh, he's in one place when he does it, and he's over in like the Gentile area when he does the feeding of the five, four thousand. So that this, that's di- difference, and I think part of it is he is pre-showing or, or, or prefiguring Jesus opening up the faith, not to just the Jewish people, but all people. And that was one way of doing it, is showing that he's doing the same miracles in different places. So as I'm working through here, um, I notice that immediately I've got highlighted. But another theme in the gospel that I'm thinking about is um, the theme of Jesus really wanting his people to be quiet about who he is in in the in the gospel itself. There's a few places where people confess him, and he uh, congratulates him for that, or you know doesn't say be quiet. And but most of the time, when Jesus is in the gospel of Mark. In fact, there's some old school papers written on this idea uh, called the Messianic Secret, you know, that Jesus didn't want people to really know him and, and know him to be the Messiah. I guess this is kind of how it goes. Um, so um, I I wouldn't know that. I don't think that's why Jesus was doing that as far as, you know, he never claimed to be Messiah, that whole line of reasoning. But it's interesting to me, and so I don't quite yet know what to think of it, but I'm creating notes about it. As I'm walking through it. So these notes here don't amount to much because it's just Jesus telling the demons simply, hey, uh, here's here's what I'm doing here. So that is uh, that is what that is what I do record there. So the same as same as the the first one there. So let's get back into Olivetti mode because it just looks nicer. And uh, oh, I didn't tell you this. But also what I'm doing, too, is that let's say not only am I just writing down particular notes, but where to just general commentary come in. And general commentary is helpful for future reference, but typically I just, um, for general commentary, I make an asterisk right here inside the heading, and I link this to the commentary that I have here. So I, when I'm looking at Simon's mother-in-law, her healing, what I've thought about it thus far, at least... <laughs> is number one, um, it's in contrast to the miracle but previously. So Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, he heals somebody uh, that's demon-possessed. And like that's a huge deal. Um, demon-possession obviously is like a, a huge thing in the Gospels. And, uh, you know, so that's in contrast here. And so I'm thinking about, you know, liter- literarily, um, what has just happened, you know, keep the context. You know, that's a pretty big important. So he just healed this woman who's got this demon possession, but now he, he or this this man who had even that possession, but now he's healing this woman who has a fever. Now fever is bad, you know, they didn't have what we have today as far as medicines for it. You know, they didn't have a Tamiflu, if this was a legitimate fever, if it was just a the type of word being used here. Um but you know she could have she could have died, but most likely she would have been okay. But so I see the contrast there between these two miracles. Um, that happens a lot in the stories, in the Gospels, and other places. And just reading in general, you see contrasts that happen. Like Genesis chapter, I think, 37 and 38, or 38 and 39, is the story of Joseph um, resisting the temptation of Potiphar's wife. But like right before that or right after it, i got to think through it. Actually, maybe I can look it up real quick because I have my Bible right here. Um, Genesis... Uh, let's say 30, let's try 37. I haven't done notes here yet. Nope. Yeah, so 38 is the story of Judah um, and the whole thing with Tamar as far as all the women, that, all the men that they sleep with, they just don't have children or whatever. But he sins by, you know, going after this woman. He doesn't know it's Tamar, but he sleeps with her. And he falls into that. Uh, and good comes out of it. Um, because, you know, the line of Judah is preserved through, through this woman. And the Messiah comes through Tamar. But then you have another contrasting story of the same sort of sexual 
not a sexual folly, but a sexual resistance. And so you see in contrast, Joseph and Judah um, showing us. So when you're studying the scriptures, um, I find that to think through, all right, is there a contrast here? Is he is he pointing out something else that's already happened that, to think of? So to me, the demon and the fever are like two opposite ends of the healing spectrum. And I want to I wanna make note of that. I don't yet to know what that means, but it seems to be that he's just showing Jesus has time to heal somebody with a fever, and he's willing to heal somebody with uh, demon possession. But also, there's this section here in Mark's gospel. It's like three miracles, right one right after another. I know there's the healing of the leper at the end of the gospel, but for right now, there's these three successive miracles that are, are talked about. So I just, that's what I write the note about, and I write it down. And this is also a text that's interesting. I, did, I don't know if I made a note about that. Um, yeah, so let's write a note together here. Um, I, you know, I'm having a hard... That's not how you spell that word. I think I figured it out there. All right, cool. This is an observational note. It's not sort of an interpretation note. It's just a simple observational note. I'm just thinking through, okay, this word in this story about this woman being healed, it's mentioned three times. All right, is there something significant there? And that's the question you have to ask is, all right, I, I've noticed that. Is that a pattern worth developing on? Or is this just some silly idea I thought in my head? Well, you don't always know. But if you track it as you're studying, you kind of come back to, oh, thanks, uh, Andy. I think I, I, think I, uh, I, think I figured it out. Um, you you kind of go, oh, okay, um, I'm recording it. All right, I'll come back to it later. And maybe it has some significance. So it's a lot of times you're just putting your note out there and you're or Rome, and eventually you'll come back to it maybe, and you'll go, oh, okay, I can develop this further. So you're making a bunch of proto-thoughts or just proto-ideas that you're not going to really mess with and, like, tell other people even. I'm telling you just so you can, like, here's how it works, you know. Um, that's that's what I like to do with that. So um, healing at evening. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, what what do I have here? Yeah, I just made a note here about Mark dividing the difference between healing and demonic possession as if they're two different things there. And so that I think it's worth noting because, you know, uh, modernists people go, well, the demon possession, that's just mental illness or whatever. And it's like, well, I think there's more to it than that. And I think Mark obviously views it more than that than just demons because he uses two different words. And so I want to respect that and, and, and note of that. But inside that, he says it because he didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So, uh, I think next time I'm not going to use LaCroix to drink from because every time I'm talking, I always feel like I've got a burp coming. And it's like, yeah, it's probably not a probably not a good look. So, prayer before dawn. I probably could think some more here but remember i'm just studying in this section right now in my mind just the miracles in mark and kind of like working through them and then maybe going back later or definitely going back later and adding some of this other stuff here but the prayer before dawn i think is a really important point to the gospel there so there you go and then i've got this last one here and i like this note i've thought about this miracle a lot because there's a lot there to think about and so this is the this is a more developed note than the other ones because i've i think i've preached on it a few times here but i think this mo this miracle is great, and I want to emphasize a few things about it. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that Jesus touching this man um, makes him unclean. So I'm opening up to Leviticus here, 5, chapter 3. Or if he touches the uncleanness of a man, whatever, his uncleanness, leprosy is uncleanness, which he is, un, uh, is with which he is unclean. And it is hidden from him. He knows of it. He shall be guilty. So you become unclean by touching somebody else who is unclean and okay just touch somebody who's unclean that would make him unclean wouldn't it well no because jesus is the messiah and he's not only just the messiah but he is yahweh himself and yahweh 
is the emanating force of the entire universe. He is life itself. Um, he is being itself. He is a being, but he is also being itself. And because of that, that means something. So Jesus, you know, it's like it's like those Chuck Norris jokes, you know. Um, you know, when Chuck Norris jumps into water, the water doesn't, he doesn't get wet. The water gets Chuck Norris. <laughs> kind of a silly joke, but the idea is that when Jesus being life itself touches somebody who is unclean, it's not the other way around where he becomes unclean. It's the man who he touches then becomes clean. And I think it's really cool. So some places this happens with Yahweh's presence when they are choosing Aaron to be priest. He says, all right, take all the members of the, the, the uh, prophets or the, uh, the priests or whatever and um, put them all together. And the persons who I'm with, I will be with for the next time. Um, as well. So he creates this, and here's this new way of being unclean. Uh, he's this, this new way of um, life coming into what is not life. Then you've got Ezekiel uh, 47, uh, verses 7 through 9 here, and it's about water from the temple of God's presence going into the Dead Sea, and the banks have trees spread up and inside there was river inside the dead sea now life there's fish inside the sea that wasn't there uh beforehand and so life comes into people and it's uh, it's it's a great point it's for dwelling on and looking at that here um arguably he's also setting up for the new law um yeah um i, I think you're right there um and I, but I think it's like the same example for the old law and the new law. But yeah, I think you're right. He's 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 showing that yes, your sins are forgiven, but like uh, yes, you're 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 clean now. Um, but there's also uh, there's there's also the fact that he doesn't want he doesn't want it to come under fire. That he's teaching um, the law is just nothing now, like what some of the people that Jude talks about as far as people using the grace of God for licentiousness and other such things. So. Yeah, I know. The hard part about this channel is the hard part about what you're struggling with is what I struggle with as far as part of me like just wants to show how to use org mode and, and you know, how I'm taking notes. But there's also like I can't help but like study this and like make comments on it and kind of like work through this text. So um, it's part Bible study, part how to study the Bible. So I'll figure it out at some point. All right, let's go back to um, nope. Let's go back to Mark chapter... Well, actually, we don't need to go to Mark chapter 1. Um, whatever questions you guys have about this or about anything else, feel free to derail me. And what I'm going to do now for this last bit, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time, or spend the last bit here, is just go to the next section. And um, actually, I think I'm... Yeah. Did I do the... Okay, yeah, I didn't do this section. Okay, cool. So um, I haven't done this section with my Org Rome notes, but I'm going to take some notes. And as I'm taking notes, if you have questions about like what I'm doing, I'm going to try to like audibly talk about this as I'm taking notes, which will probably not go well, but I'm going to do it anyways. We just got done with Jesus healing the man of the Legion, and that's really cool for a lot of reasons. And it's a lot of weird things to think about with this story because Jesus obliges to a demon, which just it's just weird. Um, I don't know how to I don't know how to think through that. You know, he says, "Send me, don't send me out of the country." He's like, "Okay, I'll listen to a demon." It's like, huh? What do you think about that? Makes me makes me ponder um, and look up some commentaries. But I try not to do that right away. So, all right, this section here in Mark's Gospel, we have a nice sandwich for us. And the sandwich means we have like this introductory story verses 24 or 21 through 24. But then we have this uh, story in the middle of it about this woman with an infirm woman who has an issue of blood. And then we have finally, we have the picking up of the story of Jairus's daughter. Um, yeah, this. I know some gospels don't or some of the gospels don't include Jairus, maybe, but. The name Jairus, but this one does, so I'm going to use Jairus right there. All right. So, oh, hey, look at that. Here's in our particular story. We have 
uh, Jairus by name came to him, seeing him, fell at his feet. So, ah, oh, there's my note. There's all like people coming up to Jesus, bowing down to him. So let's, oh my, let's uh, let's make a note about that. So we hit V um, space N R I, and then uh, bow down. So what is this? Uh, Mark five twenty two. So let's open up this note and just go Mark 5. And so what I do now here is that these are already linked. So I'm just going to create this link. And so I'm going to highlight with V. Go over a few lines, space NRI, which inserts a note. And it already has Mark 522, which I don't have a note called that. But if I backspace it to where it's just Mark 5, now I can go, ah, Mark 522. And I can link it right there. So now when I hit this, it gets me back to this page here. So and now I've got that note. And he begged him, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her. That may she be healthy and lived. And he went with him, and a great multitude followed upon him. I followed him, and they pressed upon him on all sides. All right. Now the next story. Touched his clothes. He thinks, oh, I touched his clothes. I'll be well. Oh, here's our word immediately there. So let's make a little note there. And uh, we won't do too much other than just going. Oops. I didn't highlight it. That happens if you don't highlight it. <laughs> It'll just give you the actual text title of your note. So there. And then, oh, there's another one, too. I tell you what, I, um, what I love about this way of studying is that I'm doing this, um, is, um, I know that as I'm taking these notes, like I used to take notes in all kinds of ways, you know, Oh, I, whoops, that was dumb. Let me delete my Rome tag. Cause I don't really need those. Um, is, um, Mark All right. Is that I know that um, as I'm studying here, um, these notes aren't going to go anywhere. Um, have you used Xiphos? Yeah, I actually have Xiphos. Um, the hard part about the Linux Bible apps is they don't look very good. Um, and that's I've had a hard time with those because of that. Um. And they typically don't have many modern versions. Like I know for a while, a lot of these uh, sword, sword project bios, Bibles um, had uh, the ESV, but like the ESV at one point was just like, all right, stop using our Bible and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's why I don't like Xiphos. So like if I want to use a different version now, what I'll do is I'll go buy like the Kindle version and I will rip the uh, DRM stuff so I can convert it so I can actually put it inside my um, whatever it's called, uh, Emacs, and use that. So if I want to use like a different version of the Bible, I'll just open it up here. I'll have it in my uh, Bibles file. I only have two of them right now, but I'll, I'll get some more later. But I'll, I'll just use that. So, like, let's say I want to look at this particular passage in the uh, in Mark's Gospel. But I want to use. Um, I don't actually do this this way. So let's let's redo that. Go back. All right. Let's we'll go to Mark. So Mark to do a search in uh, Vim mode. Um, you just hit slash there, and then you begin to type Mark. And as soon as you type Mark, it searches for Mark. You hit Enter to 
complete your search then and enter the search inside of mark then mark chapter five hit the slash again press five okay it's gonna look for fives and it can tell you you know oh look at all these fives but the first one is the one i really care about i hit five again and now we're here so there you go um this to me is much faster i just i really do have a hard time with all that stuff um oh, you've cr you've cried creating modules for the mlv in the es maybe the nl the mlv is that the uh maybe the new living translation that was just a typo i don't know about the mlv um so the problem is is that with those particular versions of the bible they have their copyright and i don't want to mess around with bible versions that have copyright with it i think the leb which is the version that uh logos created to go along with its interlinear versions i think that has a really loose copyright on it. You know, you can just distribute it basically how you see fit. Um, and that's why it's on a lot of these. And so I'll use that one. And I like it. And I like most versions that use Yahweh instead of Lord, which is, and I, I really like that. It helps me think about God differently whenever I think of Yahweh versus just God. So I like that. Um, yeah. Oh, modern literal version. Huh. Well, there's a billion Bible versions in the English language, so... Modern link literal version. All right. Op open source, huh? Oh, okay. I'll have to check that out. Let me make a note on that. Modern. Because uh, if it's something I like, I may make an org mode, uh, an org file list so people can download it like I have it with the um, other files. It takes a little while to do that. Um, but... It can be worth it if it's like a, a good version that's you know different than the other two versions I have on there. All right. Um, so I have the woman with the issue of blood. She also bows down to him, which is uh, something I want to make a note of. Let's go back to five. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be cured of your disease. All right. Uh, something, too, that I've just kind of been struck by in the Gospel of Mark, but also the other ones, too, is this idea of your faith has made you well. And I think I have a note on that. Yeah, faith that heals. So what is, oops, this is Mark 34, 534. So highlight it. And all right. Yeah, I think it's really interesting when Jesus says that. Um... What was that? 34? Yeah. So here's another quick trip. This is what I'm doing to go back to files. I don't know if you guys do this or not, but you hit space and then the tilde. Um, not the tilde. Um, whatever this thing makes. That file, that little button, button on the top of your keyboard there. That just takes you back to the previous space, and then that key takes you back to the previous file there. So I use that to bounce around a bit. As you use... Uh, do me max you're always looking of ways how can i do that with less keystrokes because that can get really annoying to do that all the time it's like right now i'm not using my um short uh my codes to get around text easier all right not mark 534 there we go So there you go. And uh, so in my own mind here, I'm always thinking, all right, I don't know exactly what this means yet or how to like quantify it. I have a little bit of here, you know, Jesus responds to the faith of those who desire to be healed. Even so far, far as going to say your faith has made you well, which I'm not Calvinist, but I, uh, I appreciate a lot of Calvinist writings. Um, so uh, I, the way they talk about faith and such, and I made a typo there. Um, the way they talk about faith is if like, you know, um, and as soon as you start talking about Calvinists say this, it's like, there's always going to be a Calvinist going, no, and like turn up with the uh, no true Scotsman fallacy of Calvinists never say it this way. But this, this is about how everybody is with, with 
stuff like this. But basically, faith is like, um, to say this line, your faith has made you well, you know, Calvinists would be like, well, God has made this person, Jesus made this person well. Their faith had nothing to do with it. The only reason why they had faith is because Jesus himself planted faith inside of them to actually believe the thing. But you read this and you go, okay, faith made you well. Interesting. I don't have to think about that yet. So let me just note it down and put it back. But I want to track those and maybe write a little bit more later about the whole thing. Um, yeah, space uh, tilde or whatever that is, tick. I don't know. What, I don't know what character that's called. That to me is a very quick way of moving around, and I like it a lot. All right. I'm gonna go a little bit further, a little, little farther, and then I'm gonna call it a night. Um, but if this gets some traction, I like doing this. Oh boy. Um. I like doing this uh, live type of Bible study thing because um, it helps me think better and it makes me actually study on a consistent basis because sometimes that's hard to do. So, all right. So we have this section here. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Uh, be at peace and be cured. There's probably some other things I want to note as I'm doing this. Like the fact that... Um, Uh, like the fact that uh, Jesus stops this whole thing. Like I probably would make a note about this, but this woman coming up to him and like, why does he stop the whole crowd? And eventually a oh, back tick. Oh, cool. Um, uh, yeah, back tick. Um, I feel like I got a set of tweezers to get rid of a back tick, you know? Um, but the, the whole idea of, um, this section here with Jesus healing this woman, it's almost as if to like call her out and to really say this in a sense. Um, is um, Jesus calls this woman out. And I, th I think what Jesus is doing here is to let her know, hey, woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, I see you, I know you. I know you touched me. I know that you wanted to do it hidden, but I want to make this open to you that I know you touched me. I know the power without me and your faith has made you well. Daughter, go in peace and be encouraged. Like, let's make this a moment. Let's make this, I want you to know what just happened here and I want you to soak it in that I saw you and I that I knew this happened and I want you to know this. Um, considering you're not a Calvinist, what school of thought do you most align with? Ah. All right. Um, if you're familiar, and I, every time I talk to people about this online, at least, like hardly anybody knows, but the the uh, Churches of Christ movement, the Restoration movement, that's probably what I have the most affinity with. Um, there's a book, actually, by a uh, pretty well-known scholar by the name of Everett Ferguson, he wrote a book called The Church of Christ, a biblical ecclesiology, a biblical ecclesiology for today. Um, I line up really hard with his beliefs, um, but not just his, a few people, but typically Church of Christ or COC. That's, that's the derogatory term, at least. That's fine with me. Um, so that's that's fine. Um, yeah, I think denominationalism is divisive and unhelpful. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. So the reason why I say that is just so you can kind of get where I'm coming from, at least on a lot of these issues. But uh, I think that Christianity is going to do its best if we stop almost biblical minimalism. Like, let's get rid of a bunch of stuff that's like uh, causes problems, like a lot of parachurch organizations and just... That whole money thing is, is a, a really big issue uh, with with churches, but also just the denominational hierarchy, I think, is, is really, really rough. Um, and to use the biblical model we find in Scripture to govern, our, to, 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 way that, to govern churches and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, styles of worship, as long as they're sticking. Yes, yeah. But the thing is, you have to ask yourself, you know, not to... To, to keep going with this, but to keep going with this. Is it denominationalism that allows for different styles of worship, or is it just people that have different 
styles of worship. And you can have a church over in this country or a church over in this county or maybe even across the street, although that's probably not a great thing, is um, is uh, just style, you know? Like, no church, two churches are the same. Like, you may think they are, but at the end of the day, like, they're really not. And so that's that's worth it. Um, imagine all the world's Christians. Yeah. Um, that would be great. And yes, no, it would, it would be, it would be, but you know, it's, it's, uh, there's the devil himself, the parable that Jesus told about him, Jesus coming or the, the, the person coming in and sowing tares in the field of wheat. And it's not until the final harvest day that you find out who is the chair and who is the wheat. So that's just, um, yeah, when we're all united headed in the same direction, that'll be sing singing, uh, in the, in the streets of gold. To, to use that term there. Um, yeah, culture and all that stuff does play a huge role with people. Um, which is fine. You know, like my family spent like a couple years in, a um, couple years in uh, Romania doing missionary work over there. Because my dad's also a preacher. And yeah, worship was, was different over there. But there's also just worship everywhere you go. It's, it's way different. Um, yeah. All right. Let's, let's wrap this up with as far as this, the t uh, study here of this text. Um, oh yeah. See, look, here's another one that I wanted to talk about. Um, well, five, three, four. It's really raising her daughter. You know, this is resurrection. I think that's probably why he says, don't, oops. Uh, why don't tell everybody about this? It's because <laughs> he raised her from the dead. Now, there is that war part where he's walking outside of the uh, funeral and he touches the buyer where the, where the coffin is and the, the boy comes out of the, but here's another section where he's like, not to speak. This is kind of odd. Um, Yeah. So. That's a good note there. Um, so you're saying as long as you believe in salvation is through Christ alone and the Trinity, I consider you my brother in Christ. Um, don't really care which church you go to. Ah, I would, I would uh, disagree with that. Um, not completely, but, um, I think that there's a lot of potential problems with the church that could believe in those things very much so, um, but also be in serious error. So, but those are huge. And if, I think those are definitely worth like, if they don't believe in the Trinity or believe salvation is through Christ alone, you kind of go. Ah, I'm out. Definitely, definitely grounds for going. All right, I gotta. This is this ain't right. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out with guns blazing and and preach what the what the Bible says. But <laughs> I think I'm out. Um, but I I do think that there are times where certain churches can even practice those things, but still, you know, there's there's no talk of love in that statement. You know. If, the Bible is pretty, pretty big on love as far as a church and, and growing together in love. So, um, but I, I grit with the overall sentiment of let's not be so sectarian in our thinking that, well, you teach this and you teach this and whatever. Let's not be, not understand. Um, yeah. High level principles is probably a good form of it. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, the Bible is all about the devil and the details in a lot of ways. All right, I think that's enough of 
studying I wanted to do here as far as this live stream goes. Um, I really appreciated hanging out with you guys and uh, talking through some of this stuff. After this stream or whatever, if you got more comments you want to um, at, ask me about how I got my how I have set everything up, um, I am going to do a more condensed. I've it's on my radar at least to do a more condensed video of this. As far as I'm going to just show people how I set up the Gospel of Mark to study it, and a little bit of this uh, showing people how I'm taking notes as I'm studying. So. Um, I will do that at some point and make a, a tighter video than this whole hour, some odd long video. I'll do that definitely later. Um, but for right now, all I wanted to show you is um, is just, uh, well, first off, thanks for everybody for subscribing. I really appreciate more people who will subscribe and uh, it's fun. I really enjoy this. But uh, see you later. See you later, Andy. Uh, have fun. Whatever it is you're doing. Work, I guess. And uh, I really just... I I like doing this. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, so, oh, yeah. Um, start learning some of this. Yeah, good luck. Learning Emacs is very tough. Um, I There's a lot of ways to get started with it, but there's some other YouTube channels that really do a good job as far as getting you together as far as how to do it and stuff. Um, Andy Rogers. Oh. Okay, yeah. I'll look up uh, some Anthony Rogers stuff on videos on Mark. Yeah, I was reading, watching some other person's um, videos that were just lectures on the Gospel of Mark, and I found them to be very helpful. Forget the person's name, but... Uh, I listened to several of them, so I'll definitely check out that Andy Rogers guy or Anthony Rogers and go for it. Um, middle of the day for me. Oh, okay. So you're probably like British or some. No, <laughs> yeah, you're probably British, probably. Um, yeah, go straight to Dumax. Yeah, don't mess around with plain vanilla Emacs. I have not messed around with that. It's a little because it's just like this really bare bone system. And in this situation, if you're not a coder or whatever, you're gonna need some hand holding to get through it. And I definitely needed my handheld to get through learning a lot of this stuff. So um, I'll do some more follow-up videos, kind of touching on some of the things that I hit on and then going even further. And I've got some other types of videos in mind. Um, but uh, hey, thank you so much for stopping by and watching this stream. I will uh, talk to you guys in the next couple of videos. Uh, don't, be, don't forget to like this video. Oh, Australia. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Um, Cool, cool. Um, don't for forget to uh, to like this stream. That's uh, always important. Forget it to get other people. And uh, the comments you made definitely increase the interaction. Uh, and or that interaction gets the video out to more people. So that'd be that'd be awesome. All right, guys. See you later. Bye.